Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N R. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving GRE math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the revised GRE, the second edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. We have finished. All, we, are, we are. We are finished doing almost all the problems from this book. If there is any problem at all that gives you difficulty, and if you wish to watch the solutions of the problem, you will find all the solutions from day number 251 through 400. From 251 through 400, this book happens to contain in almost all the same question, and in most cases, appearing on exactly the same page numbers as the ones that appeared in the first edition of the revised GRE. We are finished doing all the problems from this book. If you are interested in watching the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Original solutions tend to be a little lengthier and they tend to be a little bit more in depth. Right now, as we speak, we are in the process of doing some quantitative comparison questions. Quantitative comparison questions are a very important part of the exam still. They are a big chunk of the exam. Unfortunately, the new book, the revised GRE books, do not provide us, provide us with enough practice questions for the quantitative comparisons. For that reason, from day number 401, we began solving questions out of this book, the 10th edition of the general GRE. Right now, we are on page number 279. Please turn to it, page number 279, problem number 1, the very first problem. Problem number 1, given the fact that it is 1, when it was given, 87% of people had tr no trouble with at all. Here's what the problem says. In column 1 we have 2 third minus 1 minus 1 third versus 2 9. This is too simple as I said. 1 minus 2 third, 1 minus 2 third is, 1, 1 minus a third is 2 third. 1 minus a third is, is, is 2 thirds because 1 is just 3 over 3. So it's 3 thirds minus a third is 2 thirds. So what it is is 2 thirds times 2 thirds, which is 4 9. And of course, 4 9 is going to be greater than 2 9 because they have the same denominator. They have the same denominator. 4 9, of course, is going to be greater than 2 9. Answer is A. Sometimes I wonder why I explain so much something simple as that. But it's there, so it's, it's, we have to do it. We can't possibly stand here and simply say the answer is there. Do you understand? Let's do number two, shall we? Number two. Get in the habit of pausing the video every time. Sometimes I forget to remind you. As soon as I settle the problem, pause the video, do the problem yourself, and then continue and then uh, and watch the uh, and, and watch the videos to see uh, to, uh, to, uh, to compare the work that we're going to do together. Do you understand? Always solve the problem yourself. Pause the problem immediately as soon as I finish putting the problem on the blackboard whether I remind you or not. You should do it on your own instinctively. Here we go. This was 80 percent, question number two. We are told that n is equal to a half plus a one quarter plus a plus one eighth plus one sixteenth. And what we are being asked to compare is column A, column B. In column A we have 1 minus n, and in column B we have 1 sixteenth. Again, pretty straightforward question. As you can tell right from the percentile, four-fifths of the people had no trouble with it. The very first thing we have to figure out is the common denominator here. But before we do that, let's first, let's first put this quantity here. We are not comparing n versus 1 16. We are comparing 1 minus n. So let's figure that out what 1 minus n is here. 1 minus n will simply be 1 minus this quantity. And now we have to find the common denominator. We could use, we could use 16 billion as a common denominator and that will, that will, work, uh, that will do the job, that will do fine. Uh, we could do 16,000 or we can do uh, 32 or we can do 64 as a common denominator. But the least common denominator, as you know, is 16. That's the lowest one. Least common denominator, LCD, here yeah, would be 16. So our first job is to express everything with a common denominator of 16. So let's do that. Uh, one can be written as one can be written as 16 over 16. Let's multiply top and bottom of this thing by one, 8 over 8, so it becomes 16 over 16. Let's multiply top and bottom of this one is 4 over 4. 
Let's multiply top and bottom of this one of 2 over 2. So now everything has a common denominator, everything has the same denominator, everything has a common denominator, the common denominator is 16. So let's say we are done. So it's 16, 16 minus is 8 times 1 which is 8, 4 times 1 which is 4. Oh, this should have been, I'm making, I'm, I'm making too much of a mess here. I'm making too much of a mess. Oh, Jesus. Let me start again. It's a simple thing and I, and I try to be cute and sometimes it doesn't work out to be, to be cute. You understand? I should have left it the way it was. Let's do it in the most straightforward way. 1 8. What happened was that I forgot to distribute the negative sign. If we put 1 minus here, that minus is distributed throughout. I forgot that. So let's just figure out what this is. The common denominator is 16, so we can write as the common denominator of 16, we'll have, have, we'll have 8 over here, we'll have 4 over here, we'll have 2 over here, and we have 1 over here. That's it. 8 plus 2 is 10, 10, and 4 plus 1 is 5, so it's 15 over 16. There you go. Our job is to make this thing as simple as possible, not, not to make it as complicated as possible, which is what I was doing. So therefore, since n is 15, 16, 1 minus n would be simply 1 minus 15, 16, which is 1 16, of course, which is 1 16 because 1 can be written as 16, 16. So 16, 16 minus 15, 16 is 1 16, which is what we have here. The answer is C. The two quantities are equal. Number 3. Number 3. Ninety percent of people, ninety percent of people who took the exam had no trouble with it. Five raised to three versus three raised to five. I insist, I insist that you do this one, not just this one, but I insist that you do all the problem without the calculator, even though the calculator is, is allowed in the exam. As I have told you many times in the past, the calculator does not speed things up. The bloody thing slows you down. When there, is a, when there is a problem, when there is a legitimate call for the use of the calculator where, where, where the calculator actually speeds up process because it's, the, the computation is too complicated, in such a scenario, I will tell you myself that this calculator uh, calls for, uh, this, uh, this problem calls for a calculator. Do you understand? That the usage of the calculator in this particular problem is warranted. But until I tell you that, leave the bloody thing alone. Do you understand? I'm going to get out of your way now. I want you to pause the, I want you to pause the video. Do it yourself by hand and then continue and compare your work against the work we're going to do together. But always remember these questions are called quantitative comparison, not computation. That's your hint. I'm going to give you five seconds to pause and unpause the video. Here we go. 5 raised to 3 can be written as 25 times 5. And 5 raised to 5 is simply 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 times 3, 3 times 3 times 3 is 3 times 3, 3 times 3 times 3 is 27, 27 times 9, we're comparing 27 times 9 versus 25 times 5, the first number is bigger here is 27 as opposed to 25, the second number is bigger here, we have a 9 versus 5, both of these numbers are bigger than these number 25 times 5, of course it's going to be less than 27 times 9, the answer is B. Number 4. Number four. Number four is a geometry question. Seventy-eight percent of people took the exam had no trouble with it. We are told that R and S, we are told, are two distinct points on a circle of radius 1, on the circle of radius 1. There is a column A. We are being asked to compare the length of, length of segment, length of segment 
RS versus column B where we have 2. One more time I'm, I'm going to read it to you and then I'm going to get out, of your way, uh, get out of your way and then I want you to pause the video and do it yourself. Do you understand? Here's what we are told. We are told that we have two points R and S. We have, we have two distinct points. What does it mean? Two distinct points. Two distinct points simply means that they are two different points. They are two individual points. They are two uh, uh, dissimilar points. One is not lying on top of the other. We have two distinct points on a circle whose radius we are told is 1. We are being asked to compare this line segment the length of the line segment RS, the length of the line segment RS versus 2. I'll give you 5 seconds to pause and unpause the video so you can do it yourself. Here we go. It's very straightforward. We have two distinct points R and S, but they tell, us, they tell us absolutely nothing at all as to where these two points are located. All we know is that they are located somewhere on the points. So one possibility might be something like this. Maybe this is R and maybe this is S. If this is R and this is S, we know the radius of the circle. We know, we are told that the radius is 1. This distance is 1 and therefore from here to here is going to be 2. R to S, if R and S are sitting like this, it has a name. What do we call, what do we call a line that joins two points on the circle? One more time. What do we call a line that joins a line segment that joins two points on the circle without going through the center? It has a name. It is called a chord. And chord by definition, a chord by definition, it's going to be less than two. So if the R and S happens to be like this, they will form a chord. And the length of the chord is going to be less than the diameter. Because that's what two is. Two is the diameter here. Two here represents the diameter. It represents the diameter because we are told that the radius is 1. So if they happen to form a chord, then the chord is going to be less than diameter. In that case, the answer is going to be B. On the other hand, on the other hand, if purely by chance, point R and S happens to fall in such a way that they fall on the opposite end of the circle, if they happen to fall here, let's call them R prime and S prime to distinguish them from the old pair. If they happen to fall like this, where they happen to, purely by chance, if they happen to go through the center, well then this the length the length of the line the length of the line segment RS in this case is the same as the length of the diameter because that's what that is, because it's going through a center. So if, if 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 the length if the segment if the segment RS if the segment RS happens to form a diameter, if it happens to form a diameter, then diameter of course diameter of course is equal to 2. In that case, the answer would be C. Otherwise, if it happens to form a chord, the diameter will be longer, the answer would be B. We cannot tell. We cannot tell. It depends on where the points are sitting and unless and until we are told, unless and until we are told whether the line, line segment RS goes to the center or not, we cannot answer this question. If line segment RS happens to go to the center, then the answer should be C. If it doesn't go to the center, then the chord would be shorter than the diameter. The answer here is D. The answer here is D. Number five. Question number five. Let's see what five has to say. Let's see if we are done with this one. Question number five. The percentile was 77. We are told that we have X we are told that we have quantity x which is less than 5. We are also told that we have some quantity y which we are told is more than 12. What we are being asked to compare, what we are being asked to compare in column A is y minus x versus versus column B which is Seven. Again, what I want you to do is pause the video and do it yourself. I'll give you five seconds to, to do just that, to pause and unpause the video, and then we'll do it together. Well, there are two ways. There are two ways we can go about doing it. One way, one straightforward, simple, most economical way, 
is to just plug in some numbers for, the, for these variables. Just plug in some numbers and see what happens. For example, we are told that x is less than 5. If x is less than 5, if x happens to be 0, then 0, and then if y is more than 12, we are told, y is more than 12, let's pretend the y is 13. If y happens to be 13, then we'll have 13 minus 0, which is 13, which is more than 7. In that case, the answer would be A. Now, if you like, you can pl plug in some one more pair, and this time try to be creative. Make sure you, you cover all your bases. We, have, we just plug in positive number. Let's plug in so one of the numbers to be negative. We are told that x is less than 5. How about if x happens to be negative 100? If x happens to be negative 100, which is less than 5, and we are told that y is more than 12, how about if y happens to be 100? In which case, y minus x, y minus x would be 200, and 200 is again more than 7. So the answer, oh, answer turns out to be A again. The answer to this question is going to be A. But this is one way of doing it. The problem with the plugging is that, the prob problem with the plugging in technique is that, even though it is economical, it is, it is, it is quick, it is easier to uh, manipulate the numbers, concrete numbers, as opposed to solving something in an abstract manner, the, 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 that's the pro, the con is that when you're plugging in numbers, it doesn't actually guarantee that the answer is in fact A, it just tells you that based on what you see so far, the answer is A. If there happens to be some exception or, or some situation, some scenario that, it, that you did not contemplate, some weird scenario, then, then you are in trouble. So here, let's, let's take a look at it in an abstract manner, shall we? It's not, it's not, that, it's not that complicated, here it is. I want you to visualize it. I want you to visualize it. We are told that x is less than 5. So let's say x is here. This, this is our 5, let's say. And x is here, let's say. This is our x, let's say. This is our x. And we are told that y is more than 12. Let's say 12 is here. If this is 12, and we are told that y is more than 12. If y happens to be more than 12, let's say here is y, then we can see immediately that since this distance from 5 to 12, since this distance from 5 to 12 is exactly 7, and the given the fact that x falls to the left of 5 and y falls to the right of 12, then it really doesn't matter what x might be, it really doesn't matter what y might turn out to be, this distance will always be more than 7. This distance, we do not know what it is, but it's always going to be more than 7, and that's how we write it, 7 with the plus sign on top. Do you understand? So this distance, y minus x is going to be always something more than 7. And of course something more than 7 is more than 7. That's a tautology. I was about to say I'll see you tomorrow, but then I just realized that towards the very end, inadvertently in the very last sentence, uh, we introduced our vocabulary words, so now we have to take care of it. Photology. I know we learned it. Just give me one second. I'm going to look up in my index card here as to when we learned totality under 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 the index card for T. Day number 38. Vocabulary. Day 38. If you're interested in improving your vocabulary, just type in GRE vocabulary words. GRE vocabulary words. Day 38. And learn the word tautology. Tautology. Let me first use it in the context. See if you can uh, see it here. So what we said is that. Since y, since, um, okay, we're going to use the word tautology in the context here, it will appear towards the very end of the sentence. What we said is that since y is more than 12, we are told, since y is more than 12, y will appear to the left of 12. Since we are told that x is less than 5, therefore x will appear to the right of, uh, y will appear to the right of y, uh, 12, and x will appear to the left of, left of uh, 5. And therefore, as we can see clearly, that this distance from x to y it's going to be something more than 7. We do not know what it is exactly, but whatever it is, it's always going to be something more than 7. y minus x, this distance from y to x here, this y minus x, is always going to be something more than 7, and something more than 7 is of course more than 7. Something more than 7 is of course more than 7. That was a bloody tautology. A tautology is something that is true by definition. Learn it in the video in, in, in detail. Do you understand? And you will learn some other interesting useful words that will help you raise your score in the English portion of the exam. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.